Excellent. Thanks, Josh. And we were just all waiting for you, Stefan. Like it doesn't start until you're here. Okay. Um, all right. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we had a, I think a pretty good version of this this morning. You'll have to bear with me. It, you know, running that at 8 a.m. this morning, plus doing all the other things during the day and then attempting to run exactly the same thing again uh, is uh, relatively adrenal squeezing. Um, so I'll try and be as thoughtful and um, such as I tried to be this morning. I think we had a good discussion there. I believe the recordings are up for that perky. That's a good one, Josh. Thank you. Um, we have a recording up of that for anybody who wants to listen to the discussion from this morning, in particular, sort of the last hour or so. I think the breakdown we had um, this morning was actually pretty good. Um, set the groundwork in the first sort of 50 minutes or so. Norman then reminded me that people might actually want to have a break. Um, so do that uh, for five to 10 minutes and then come back and use the last uh, time that we have for thank you, Peter, uh, for the discussion. Um, so for those that uh, don't know, my name is Chris Allen. I'm VP Software Engineering for Glencoe Software. And putting things together for today's presentation are with me are Sebastian Besson and uh, Norman um, from Scalable Minds. So I'll pass thing pass over to Sebastian to allow him to introduce himself and then to Norman. And then we'll probably just do a little, let Josh do a little intro on what interactions we'd have we've had with the Czar community and things we've discussed with Steering Council. So with that said, over to Sebastian. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, so Sebastian, I've been part of this community for the last 10 years, <clears throat> for the last 10 years, mostly under the OME banner. I've been working uh, for Uni of Dundee with Jason, um, various things, including IDR and NGFF, obviously, for the last year. And I joined Glencoe Software in September. So I'll be working, uh, talking from this perspective moving forward. Excellent. Thanks, Sebastian. Floor is yours, Norman. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Norman, co-founder of Scalable Minds. Um, if you were there last week, I gave a demo of WebNosos, which is a tool that we built for a bioimaging community, which uh, is a visualization, annotation, collaboration tool for very large data sets. And uh, yeah, we're also participating in the spec writing of ZAR together with my colleague, Jonathan. And uh, yeah, WebNosos is a Scala backend. So that's why we are interested in basically finding some some uh, collaboration on the czar java side of things excellent thanks norman josh yeah so for this meeting i'll put on my czar steering council hat um and kind of represent their um interest and so that that covers the specification and a number of implementations um but i'll try to sit in the background and just kind of answer questions when necessary um, part of where we're coming from here is that I think in the course of this year, um, the Czar Steering Council has, has set up an implementation council, which is really tasked with making sure that the specification um, matches the interest of each individual language, like you know, questions about Julia and C++, these, these come up pretty frequently because we really want to have one format that we can access from all of these languages. Um, and it's pretty well known that czar v2 is overly specific to python you know so there are statements that refer to python in the specification um and that's something that's being worked on to get rid of in v3 to make things like a, a czar java implementation um easier to to implement and support um in kind of inviting the various communities to join one of the communities that chose not to join was jzar um, so it's an implementation of, of the V2 spec um, from Brockman Consulting, so kind of in the geospatial uh, community. Um, and really, you know, their, their position, and it's the one that we can all understand, is they're going to just implement what, what they need to get their work done, and they're not going to go beyond that. So there have been various PRs against their repository, and that really didn't 
find much um, acceptance from their side. So they, you know, they appreciate the fact that people were working on it, but they weren't going to get involved and they weren't going to implement V3 or sharding or any of these kind of advanced features. So both Glencoe and Scalable Minds had already forked JZAR um, and had all of these PRs that they were looking to submit upstream. Uh, and th those are now just sitting on their private fork. So what do we do about that? Um, so this discussion is largely about trying to, to solve the problem of JSR, um, bring all of those changes back together and have a low level ZAR Java implementation that we can all build on top of. Um, so the, the JSR community, you know, was, we talked to them or the developers and asked, you know, are they all right with that? And they said, definitely, we, we would even like to use that thing ourselves. So that's great. Haley Johnson is here from NetCDF Java. Um, Similar situation, you know, if there's uh, if there's a low level library, then that would make her life simpler. Hope the same thing is true for N5 czar and others. Uh, I don't think we have any other implementers here um, in the morning. So there's Jean Karim has brought up, for example, well, maybe we want to wrap the Java implementation. Sorry. Yeah, wrap that Java implementation with R to support the R community, et cetera, et cetera. The goal would be to have something that we could consider a reference implementation in Java, similar to the Python implementation. So that's really the starting point of the discussion. Um, and I've probably stolen a little bit of uh, Chris's uh, presentation, but it's always hard to know. So I'll stop there. Excellent. Thanks, Josh. The hook is out and off the stage. All right, let's roll. Try and get through this as quickly and efficiently as I can. Um, hopefully everybody can see that right on. So um, what expanding a bit on what Josh said, why are we here? Um, why are we spending this time? Um, time is precious. Well, we want to build a great library uh, for the JVM, uh, for Omizar in particular. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to make sure that the we're building that on top of a strong foundation, right? Um, so we put together what's uh, what you're going to see here, myself and uh, Sebastian, uh, on behalf of the OME project, Scalable Minds, and Glencoe Software, just to kind of give a sense of what what the community is like right now, what options we have to do this, what work has already been done, uh, et cetera. So I'm going to go through a little bit about how we kind of got ourselves into the situation and why it's not an easy problem to solve. Um, do a little bit of history, uh, including going through the variety of projects that are already in this space. Um, give a sense of kind of where our projects are and which tooling we're using now and the kind of pitfalls and, and difficulties that we have there. Uh, and then finally finish with the proposal of, of some of the things that we'd, that we'd like to do uh, together. So I'm um, expanding on this, why are we here question. So um, again, in order to really deliver on these OME and GF OME and OME czar library concerns, building things to handle the higher level metadata, worrying about all these things uh, on the JVM. We we need that great foundational czar infrastructure first. If we don't have that, then we're kind of really building on a shaky foundation and we're, we're just wasting a lot of time. Um, we know that the biomedical imaging community and probably other communities on the JVM are alive and well. They're working in a whole bunch of different areas. There's lots of great projects out there uh, that are inside this ecosystem. Um, at the moment, that sort of JVM czar community is extremely fragmented. We got no, I'm going to only talk about sort of about half a dozen different impl implementations here. There's several others. Um, I know that there's at least of the people that I can see on video now, at least half a dozen people who have open PRs that are not merged into a bunch of the repositories that I'm about to talk about um, and have certainly started conversations. So, you know, it's incredibly fragmented right now. 
that fragmentation in the community increases the developer friction. It really makes new people really question about which implementations to use and what capabilities that they have that affects the adoption inside that JVM community, right? Um, many of these essential libraries lack maintainers, and that isn't just with respect to Czar itself. That's true for a bunch of fairly fundamental um, dependencies. But, you know, just personally, I think, you know, and I've tried to do some of these things on Czar community and some of the specification conversations, I think cross-language participation strengthens the Czar specification development. This isn't just about what's happening in Python. Um, and we're trying to act a little bit like a foil uh, to the work that's happening in Python so that we don't get too carried away building Python specific things, because that's really not what we're trying to foster here. Certainly if we're talking about data exchange, public data sets and all these types of things. Um, and it's also, you know, speaking very sort of personally on behalf of Glencoe Software, we're interacting with a lot of commercial entities um, and they're often not in that space uh, and they need that, that confidence there. Also, one thing we actually spent quite a bit of time talking about this morning was getting a sense of what the baseline features are for czar impl implementers and which things we expect to be there out of a reference implementation that's not just for uh, the JVM, but probably also for C++ or for implementations, for example, on the .NET framework or what have you, right? Um, there's lots of different uh, things there. With all that said, I'll just put up my disclaimer now. You know, we are not experts in all these libraries and all these projects. We were just talking with, before everyone joined here. We're certainly not experts in a bunch of cross-domain uh, areas. I'm not a geophysical scientist. In fact, we have none of those people on on the team, um, et cetera. So, you know, we're we're trying the best with the information that we have and with the projects that we have. I would love for somebody to tell me once we're done here. Hey, there's this project. It does everything. Just use this. Uh, and we don't have to do anything. We can just, you know, all rely on on this one bit of effort. Um, so part of putting this information out there is to try and is to make sure that the position that we have and the perspective and the sort of view that we have is is consistent with the rest of the community, right? Um, I think you heard this from Norman already. Um, these days in 2022, being on the JVM means more than just Java. Um, and you know, beyond Norman here, we're not experienced Scala or Kotlin developers here, um, but, we, but we know that there are people on the JVM who are who are definitely working in that space, right? Um, we have pretty good native code skills by the people who have kind of contributed to what's here, um, but it's not our primary programming environment. We're not, you know, doing those things day in, day out. So our ability to evaluate some of the native code implementations is substantially restricted by that. You will hear nothing, for example, here about XTensor or uh, TensorStore implementations in C++, et cetera. Um, those are things that we need to consider, but just didn't, you know, we spent about six to eight weeks on, you know, taking a look at all of these things and trying to have a good cross-section of, of implementations and look at what is in the space. Um, we certainly didn't, you know, do everything. So what do we actually want this library to do? What would we expect a reference implementation of czar in on the JVM to be able to do? And this isn't a new question. Um, I can't remember the exact person who asked the question on on what at that point in time was actually the czar Python repository about, hey, it'd be really nice if there was something on the JVM. Uh, that's a long time ago now. And you know the naive question is, well, it's been multiple years. Why isn't this done? Surely this is easy, right? There's lots of these libraries in Java. There's lots of work in the community on a lot of these different things. Why why isn't there a reference implementation that, that everybody can use? Um, and hopefully I'll convince you that that isn't actually an easy question to answer uh, and is actually a pretty tricky systems programming problem to solve. So, you know, just amongst the group that we had kind of contributing to the requirements list here, um, I've tried 
you know, kind of digest that down to a few bullet points. There's lots of nuance to each one of these things, but fundamentally we kind of settled on, on what's here on the right-hand side of this slide, right? Java 8 plus support for at least the V2 specification now, including the dimension separator, um, be largely inspired by the czar Python foundational concepts so that we don't have completely different language uh, that we're using for these things, support the basic data types. We're not going to get into discussions here about trying to translate Python date times between into Java and all this kind of stuff. Um, should support a, a reasonable cross-section of backend stores. That includes HTTP and S3. Uh, we did not expand that to uh, additional public cloud uh, resources, but um, I'm sure those will will come in time, that we should have an extensible compression framework that allows us to bring both the existing sort of lossless set of compression algorithms in place, but provides extension points to allow lossy compression and other um, tools to come in. We should have a chunk API. Uh, we should have a basic slicing API to allow you to access arbitrary regions without having to slice the chunks yourself. Um, and from the sort of nice to haves area, this was um, in particular a real requirement for those who are already in Scala. While we really need to have asynchronous implementations of this API, it's insufficient for us to just be synchronous only. And that's true for us uh, at Glencoe Software as well with a lot of the server side work that we're doing. Um, and critically, the sort of community environment has to be accepting and willing to deal with some of these newer features that are going into the czar specification. Uh, either already or coming soon uh, in V3. So, you know, there's whatever it is, nine, 10 bullet points there. Seems simple, right? Uh, well, just to do this in Python, let's look at what it actually takes right now, the amount of effort that it takes uh, and the amount of libraries that it takes in order to deliver on some of these criteria, right? If you just pip install czar right now, you get you know, largely what's on the left-hand side of this slide right now. Um, and I think at last checking, you know, NumPy itself is about 1.7 million lines of code, right? Um, there's num codecs in here for all the compressors, uh, et cetera. There's, you know, lots of developers. I didn't, you know, aggregate up all the GitHub stars and focus um, for these, the, there's an incredible number of people across a whole wide cross section of domains, including some that are just focused on scientific Python and don't have a domain set of domain specific requirements working on these packages, right? Um, it doesn't seem like that when you just, you know, pip install it, but there's a huge amount of developer firepower that's in place to allow this stuff to happen. And that's just working with czar on the file system. As soon as we go one step further and we say, well, we want to work with czar on the file system, but then we also want to work with czar in S3, the number of packages that get pulled in in order to achieve this kind of stuff is immense, right? We're up to like 20, 25 packages here. We've got NumPy, we've got NumCodex, we've got FS spec, we've got, you know, all of the AWS SDK, we've got a series of asynchronous IO libraries, we've got all this stuff, right? Um, just amplifies the amount of you know developer work that's going into the, into these things and focused in these areas, right? And we all know that the scientific Python community is kind of the hot place to be right now. I don't think that this community should apologize for any of of this success. There's been a lot of great work here. There's been a, there's a lot of really talented people working in this space, but it just doesn't. We don't have these people necessarily in the java space in the jvm space that you know we might they might exist and you know but it's tricky to find them right and it's tricky to have projects that are necessarily focused on all these things right um part of that is the native code ability and all of these types of things but you know l largely it's just a question of of resource and number of people so we got to figure out a way to kind of do more with less right um so with that kind of, you know, scoping, it's not like no work has been done, right? Um, so if we look at kind of the last, I don't know, five years-ish uh, of all the projects that have kind of started and working in this space, and this is just a snapshot of some of them, right? It's, it's the ones that uh, that we looked at 
uh, in a reasonable detail. And, and this really is the projects that we've touched or interacted with uh, between Blanco Software's work on bioformats to raw and OME's work on trying to do OME czar and OME NGFF. I'll remind everybody, you know, if you want to look at the history of how bioformats to raw got to where it is, um, we actually didn't start with czar at all. In fact, all of bioformats to raw, bioformats to raw started with N5, right? So, you know, and Norman's group is up there. They're way off the left hand side here, and you know that those projects started way back in in two in 2011. So, you know, there's a whole progression here of projects and, and efforts, not like no work has been done. Um, and, you know, a lot of blood, sweat and tears has already been put into the space. So it's trying to find a way to make sure that we, you know, harness that uh, as best we can, right? Uh, so we kind of go left to right. We've got stuff on here. It started the N5 projects, you know, sort of early 2017. That's when, you know, the first commits on those repos uh, started. Um, Constantine started Z5 not too much later. Um, that's obviously native code. Um, the first questions on the czar community uh, about alternative implementations actually started not in the JVM side, but actually questions about MATLAB. Um, and if you want, you can go back and look at some of those issues on czar community. Um, so there is an interest uh, at the community at large at trying to think about cross-language implementations and, and working beyond uh, Python. Um, the Laserson Lab folks started NDRA Scala uh, in towards the end of 2018. More work there. That's even across uh, a bunch of different formats, um, initially with HDF5. Uh, then, as Josh was mentioning, the Brockman Consulting folks on JZAR, it's kind of early 2019. Uh, Stefan's group, again, starts with the N5 ZAR uh, repo, sort of mid-2019. Um, you know, before we had uh, Bioformats to RAW kind of become what it is today. So, you know, there's lots of diff there's lots of work that's happened, you know, in that sort of 2017 to 2020 group. And then... Um, Haley and others from the Unidata group and, you know, specifically on NetCDF and both the C and the Java side uh, have those implementations starting to crop up here. So that, you know, you look at this and you think, oh, geez, there's a lot of uh, duplication of effort here. There's lots of uh, doing the same thing. Um, can we bring this together? Can we learn from each other and try and, uh, bring some of these concepts together? Are we actually, do we need to have these things be separate? Is there something um, critical about that? So, you know, as a group, we started to, to kind of look at that predominantly, as I said, with the lens of what we've done in bioformats to raw, uh, but also what we've done uh, collectively with WebNOSIS. So at least for this group, the kind of current state of play is the following. Um, we're using JSR. We're using JBlosk with the C Blosk native code uh, blobs, and we're using a one of the plethora. I think there's about 110 forks of this repository right now with a variety of different options. Um, a JSR 203 uh, NIO implementation to allow basically basically what FS spec is doing for Python, uh, allowing that same thing to happen in Java. So you can you know make a S3 bucket look like a file system, Java, right? Use path objects on it, et cetera. So that's kind of where, you know, at least this group is today with what it's doing. And again, I'll emphasize this group means OME, Glencoe Software, and Scalable Minds. Um, in terms of what that actually means in sort of playing our requirements uh over top of that that I started with that we kind of came together and said hey these are these are the basic set of things that any library that's going to do what we need to do needs to achieve um obviously we've got something in java that's functioning it's working with the v2 specification including the dimension separator it's largely inspired by that czar python api 
uh, supports most of the data types that we would want it to support, kind of supports a variety of backends. There's lots of issues, which I'll mention here in a second. Um, just working with S3, and there isn't really a first-class implementation for just working on top of HTTP. And for anybody who's worked with this stuff in any serious way, the S3 API is not standard HTTP. You've got, it's a fundamentally different way of looking at things. Uh, we did discuss a little bit this morning about what happens when you start to try to use uh, signed requests and all sorts of other things with uh, these stacks. So, you know, the store support is okay, but not great right now. We don't have an extensible compression um, framework that's pretty problematic, especially for things that that we care about in the whole slide imaging community. Um, we've got a pretty good chunk API and we've got a pretty good basic slicing API. I can ask for, for the area that I want and I can get uh, to get the bytes. We're completely synchronous in all these APIs. They're using the AWS One SDK, so there's no asynchronous constructs for accessing AWS uh, or HTTP for that matter. Uh, and as Josh said, we've more or less got a, a community in that JSR side that really isn't that motivated at the moment to uh, support these additional features or even to accept um, contributions from the community to add them. Uh, just a quick slide with the links for uh, JSR there and where where the artifacts are are, are setting. So this is kind of a high level view of all the components that are here. I'm not going to go through this in painstaking detail. It's it's not too important uh, for the purposes of of this discussion. But you get a kind of sense of of all the things that are possible here. You will notice that the NetCDF common data model. Um, Multi-dimensional arrays are used to do a lot of the sort of cutting and chopping uh, for the slicing APIs and uh, all of the shenanigans with respect to dealing with object storage uh, are kind of laid bare there. So, you know, that's the current state of play with these uh, variety of, of libraries. Um, and that's not without its problems, right? Um, out of the box today without as Josh said, you know, random PRs and and commits from ourselves, scalable minds or others in the community, S3 anonymous access is completely broken. That is accessing the S3 API critically, not, you know, just accessing over raw HTTP. Um, something that's really important to us because we're deploying a lot of solutions in biotech and pharma where we have to justify literally every IM permissions uh, element that we have. And some of you, I'm sure, have tried to deal with this kind of stuff with internal um, academic IT departments. There's an, an incredibly excessive set of permissions that are required for a lot of these things to work um, currently. This infrastructure really doesn't um, play nicely with S3 compatible storage. So if you're doing things like using Ceph to back uh, some of your own object storage or using Minio or what have you, um, it makes a bunch of requests and, and such that are really tricky to support uh, in those areas. Uh, as we've kind of probably belabored at this point, uh, the library maintenance is poor at best for a lot of these things. Um, and, you know, that's definitely true with the commitment to new features. There's, you know, essentially everyone's got their own fork of this stuff. There's literally dozens of them. Uh, and I've talked about the synchronous set uh, already. So, if we look at the ecosystem now and try and get a sense of what everybody is doing, um, you know, let's look at some of, of the other options and 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 you know stacks that we could be using. So we'll start in that kind of chronological order and look at you know what N5 and N5 czar are doing now. Uh looks a lot like the JZAR implementation as far as what you know which boxes are ticked. Um we've got you know, largely all these things uh, possible, but we've got one kind of fundamental issue, right? And that's that the focus here is N5, and it should be, right? Um, and Czar is implemented as a sort of backend for the N5 API. That makes the sort of composition of N5, Czar, and object storage or alternative storage techniques really tricky. And we've been trying to resolve those things with uh, Stefan and his team for a while now. Um, you know, we'll have to decide whether that's something that we can resolve together or whether that's, you know, just unresolvable. Um, but, 
you know, definitely the focus is not SAR. And, and like I said, it shouldn't be. This is, you know, what N5 is trying to do. So, you know, we've got all of those concepts there. So, um, you know, one, one other set of implementations. So, you know, casting our gaze a little bit further. So we've got, you know, that native Z5 implementation. Could we use that? Does that have a have parts that we need? Uh, it's native code. We'd have to wrap those things. Uh, we've got some of the basic components, but really the focus of this repository initially was to provide a C++ foundation for a for Python access. It wasn't really set up to necessarily um, predominantly have a, a C++ um, access and you know work through JNI. Uh, it's not clear how we would support. Uh, asynchronous operations in that stack, we'd have to, you know, think seriously about how to do all that kind of stuff uh, in C and C++. Uh, Z5 actually relies on Xtensor for a lot of the things that it does. Josh mentioned this morning that the um, developer momentum there has kind of petered out after some of the EOSC funding. Um, I think that's you know true for a lot of the work that we're going to talk about is that there's a lot you a lot of interest initially and then the the momentum kind of slows down and makes it hard to uh to continue that um and continued continued focus effort is what's required to you know maintain some of these um low level uh libraries. I think we all know that the C++ developer pool in our community is pretty shallow. Uh, the number of people who could potentially contribute to something like this are um, is definitely not what it is in Python, certainly, and certainly not what it's like in Java. Um, so, you know, that's another thing that we'd have to consider if we wanted to 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 try and use some of these things, right? I'm um, thinking about the Scala side. I won't talk too much about about this. Norman knows um, probably better than anybody that. Going Java to Scala is a reasonably is a reasonable thing to be doing, but going the other direction is a tricky business. Uh, you really have to think about what you're doing, and you have to kind of restrict some of the Scala-like things that you're that you're going to do if you want that to be acceptable. So, even if we could get past some of those things, there's a ton of things that here that are actually, you know, on rocky footing. And as I was saying earlier. Uh, with respect to sort of developer momentum, you know, lots of initial uh, work on this repository, but we haven't really seen anything happen uh, since, you know, sort of early February uh, 2019. That means there's no dimension separator support here. Uh, everything's assuming, you know, dot separated. Um, there's, it's not clear that, you know, literally any of the stores beside file system are even supported here. So, you know, there's lots of good things to look at in terms of how we could potentially interface with the Scala community and thinking about you know the ways that that community considers uh, this work, um, but you know it's it's definitely a steep um, learning curve to to go that direction, right? Um, and then just to finish. You know, we've got the NetCDF Java implementation. There's lots of nice um, work that's been done by uh, Haley and her team there uh, to support a whole wide cross section of things. Um, I think we know that you know supporting multiple stores there is tricky at best. Um, how we would do that? How we would do you know all those things? There's the you know extensible set of components there. Uh, we would have to think seriously about how we would could potentially work in uh, any sort of asynchronous capabilities into that. Um, but again, kind of you know, like we were talking, like I was saying about N five originally, Zar is not the core focus of the development here. It's trying to address the needs of that NetCDF community and the common data model and all those components. There's large chunks of the NetCDF core that we'd have to include on our class paths in order to do that. Um, it's obviously new. Like we were saying about the other um, repositories, there's always you know, a lot of an effort initially, um, but it's not clear what that group is capable of doing, how we would potentially make third-party contributions, what the release uh, structures look like, et cetera. So um, 
you know, it's something to learn if we decide to to pull some of these things together. So, um, Josh said to me, well, hey, it would be great if we had a kind of high level overview of these things. And I said, oh, I, I don't really have time to put one together. So of course he quickly whipped one up for us. And this is kind of that high level view uh, with thinking about those those requirements and the libraries that that are currently in the space and what they're trying to do, right? Um, and the reality is that we've got pretty good support across the whole wide cross section of them. The question is how to take that existing momentum and that existing set of code bases um, and deliver something that's going to last the test of, last uh, and stand the test of time. Um, and allow the community to work together and, and push through on some of these things. Um, so with all of that said, and having looked at all, all these things, um, where we kind of came to uh, as a group and talking to Josh and you know thinking about what's happening on the um, czar side, we need some of these fundamental libraries to have the maintainership and the attention they deserve. Um, Jay Blosk has had basically no attention at all. Uh, in fact, the main repository that's in the Blosk organization uh, has a bunch of PRs from Ryan Williams that he finally got tired of waiting for them to be merged and just forked the thing and pushed it uh, up. You know, I think that's the spirit of a, of a lot of the work here is really well-meaning people trying to get their own work done and scratch their own itch and deliver value for their communities. Um, and that's a good thing, right? Um, to be motivated to deliver things to the to the people who matter, uh, which at the end of the day are all of our users. Um, you can't wait four months to get fundamental things um, addressed. You just go, you do what you need to do. Um, you get things released. Um, and what's, you know, the kind of result of that is everyone uses these forks, right? Uh, and I don't think Ryan's here, but if you he were here, he'd probably say, be the first one to put his hand up and say, I never wanted to have to maintain this stuff. Um, but I kind of fell into it. Um, and what has resulted there is more or less exactly, again, the same thing. We have something that hasn't been, um, maintained and we all rely on it. Literally every one of those projects that's in Java is not implementing its own Blosk decompression, right? Um, so, you know, we all rely on this stuff, um, but, you know, basically nobody's maintaining it. So um, try and work with the community to get, either get this back into Blosk with a reasonable um, set of active maintainers and um, a good approach there or take, uh, Ryan's fork there from the Laserson Lab uh, organization on GitHub and get it under our developers so that we can uh, have some good stewardship of it. Uh, at least for us, we're going to continue uh, our work and providing object code uh, for those people who need it. Uh, we started off with Windows and Mac OS, at least um, Intel uh, CPUs, but we'll be doing um, the M1 uh, ARM stuff here shortly. So try and continue to do, to commit to making sure that those, uh, native blobs are available and easy for people to get, because I don't think any of us are putting our hands up saying, yeah, really, I want to roll a pure Java implementation of this stuff. Um, I think it's good for the community as a whole to have high quality JSR 203 implementations for a bunch of alternative storage. Uh, platforms. Obviously, we're talking about S3 here first, at least for us. Azure is a huge, um, it's something that's requested uh, a lot um, from our commercial uh, customers. GCS is there. I know uh, Stefan and the group at Genelia has quite a big um, GCS uh, set of dependencies. So, you know, it's good to have high quality uh, JSR 203 implementations that uh, the community can rely on. So we'd like to try and bring those into, again, a place where we can maintain them. Um, Ryan's group, again, kind of same thing, 
hey, I've got all these PRs open, I'm fixing some fundamental bugs. I can't get these PRs merged upstream. So I do the forks, you know, I spend quite a bit of effort going and then, you know, you move on to other things because you got other uh, problems to solve, right? Um, so then just finally, I think what we'd like to try and do is to get a czar Java sort of reference implementation location inside of czar developers to try and bring some of these concepts from uh, N5 czar, from N5, from JZAR, from Nuts 8 off Java, et cetera, and try and get uh, a cross section of requirements into the core, um, place where we can all work on them, um, place where we can all see them. That will hopefully also foster more of the discussion around how can we make sure that we don't have a completely Python focused set of um, specification requirements. And I think that's essential. We talked about that quite a bit uh, this morning. You know, it, it's actually pretty important that we participate in that process. It's going to be really easy with the number of developers and the amount of uh, momentum that there is behind the scientific Python community for that just to kind of run away from us. Uh, if we don't participate there, then those decisions will be made for us, right? Um, so trying to find a sort of central place for these things to happen probably doesn't mean any of the projects that are there now go away. I think they will continue to be supported for, but at least if we can bring some of these things uh, together, um, then hopefully we can all benefit. And you know, a lot of these fundamental things that we're all using and all depending on uh, can get the maintainership that they deserve. So I'm gonna close there. Uh, we're a little quicker than this morning, but it's probably time for Norman and uh, for anything that he wants to add and for us to have a little break before we, um, for everyone to kind of digest what was said and to come back uh, with discussion uh, afterwards. So the floor is yours, Norman. Uh, nothing to add at this point, can go straight to the break. So we're gonna be back in, let's see. 15? Yeah. 15 minutes, top of the hour. Next one, guys. Thank you very much. See you soon. Norman's all about the breaks. Oh, yes. Party pleaser. Thanks, guys. But then Thanks, it's also Josh. a little bit unfair to everybody who was who was like waiting for the hour to, <laughs> to they, take they can watch it on YouTube. <laughs> 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 I can watch it on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um just saying during the break there that uh since we have both Stefan and Haley here with us, um to give them the opportunity to say anything that they'd like to say um about their own directions, things that they care about, um, etc. before we open the floor to a wider conversation. So what are we going to do? Rand 50 to figure out who gets to go first or? No, no, Haley goes first. All right. It's decided. I don't know if that was a short shot or the long shot. Um, I don't have a lot to say here. I really appreciate the overview of like what is supported in, in Java across these projects. I actually screenshot of that if you don't mind to hold on to. Um, can't say for Nesty of Java, our it's beta support for, for our, uh, we have just barely gotten user to come in and start kicking the tires and find the bugs, the performance snags and stuff. So I would I would call it beta support at this point. Um, and we, yeah, we don't have a huge amount of resources to devote to it. So excited by the idea that we could kind of pool resources. And if there were to become a kind of shared low level project, I would be happy to help contribute to that because that would still end up helping out my project and, and ultimately offloading some of my work. So I would, I'd be really excited to help contribute there. No, that's great. I mean, I think that's certainly our motivation by having this conversation. And also, I think it's probably fair to say, maybe I'll just speak on behalf of all the other projects. Um, pretty much everyone's beta, Haley. Uh, you know, Jean Karim asked me this morning, oh, which one of these projects should we use? Is there something going to be ready in the next two months? And I said, well, I could put my hand on my heart probably and say that none, no one project here is completely ready to do all these things. And certainly, None even comes close 
right, to what is currently possible in Czar Python. Uh, they don't even, there's there's not even the, probably the best one we have right now uh, is the work that um, Stefan and his group have done. If you take all of the packages together, that's probably the, the has the best, um, you know, overarching set of things that are, that is possible. And you now what, Stefan, it probably does what, 10, 15% of what you can do right now with um, Czar Python. So um yeah it's it's an immense amount of work to to look at you know what's there now and say hey we're going to we're going to try and do something that's the same and i don't think any of us are saying either that you know we want to do everything that the python stack can do i'll, I'll just throw in the middle here there's also a very real need to throw things out of the python implementation <laughs> so that's going to be happening too um and maybe we'll meet somewhere in the middle what you mean? Not everybody's using the MongoDB storage driver to store their czars. Right on. Floor is yours, Stefan. Okay. Um, so, so I, I tried to. So, first of all, thanks a lot for this for the summary. This was really useful, and 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 thanks for all the work that went into into that and and exploring these these things. Um, I would like to so 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 maybe I start with what what I think, and that's basically the same that um, basically the same thing that Haley said. I think it would be awesome to have um, a group take responsibility for as our implementation that can then be used by other consuming libraries um, in on the Java side. Um, but that so so I would I would strongly. Um, wish for that in reference implementation to not um, include any of the gimmicks. Like, um, I don't know, there's a lot of discussion about first in, first out caching, um, attributes caching, um, consolidated arguments, blah, whatever, like, like, like all these things that can actually be solved elsewhere. Um, and instead focus on, on the, on the core um, access patterns that you, that you need. And that is loading chunks, um, reading and writing attributes in several places um, and and potentially one thing that we're that we're currently missing in the n5 implementation for example um, seeking into chunks um, so so you can make them into sharded um, objects or stuff like that and and I, th I think we're not talking enough about what these core um, features are because when when so you just you just said this this N5 czar implementation is 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 focused on N5 and my aim with N5 was to implement an API that actually unifies across these various platforms so so we can access HDF5 and N5 and whatever somebody comes across um, through this this primitive API but obviously this is this is a this is a focus that is I don't know this is specific to our work so we have a set of data types that we that we're interested in at this point uh, we made the compressors extensible that's great. Um, but we we had no interest in charting, for example, um, so far. And and these are the limits of this API, right? So so it can talk well to to HDF five and everything that that Java um, um, interprets natively. And um, but but that's that's the deal. So um, I don't know if we should if we should if we should talk about this. So so the Python API, for example, in in Python, czar is a whole world. That um, that is not just the essential stuff, but is everything in there and their gimmicks and friends, and that is mainly born out of the availability of various um, libraries. And you just dump them on, on 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 top of this, and then you then you benefit from this entire framework, and you use the same the same words and the same concepts and ideas in this um, storage format specification. And so it's it's not it's not well um, separated. And and it and I think in Java because the the these the, the this landscape is different, and we have different libraries and um, and other concepts. Um, it's not easy to convert that un entire structure um, like 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 in a straightforward word by word way. Um, technical details. Um, you mentioned that with the N five czar. Um, implementation, we have this issue that that N5 czar is basically this backend that goes through the N5 API, um, and that was fun. But of course, it requires that you that you double implement like the the storage backends because that goes through the same interface. And we had this discussion over the years. Um, it was difficult. 
we started trying, um, we started fixing this um, in a branch of the N5 library um, to separate these access patterns. And we initially tried to do it the same way that um, JSR is doing this through the um, file system implementation. Um, but then we noticed that particularly on um, object stores like S3, um, you're doing a lot of unnecessary round trips um, if you use the same um, um, access primitives that you use in a file system layer. And, and that is terrible because it costs you a lot of time and um, for, 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 um, for latency um, because object stores are ultimately different. And so we threw all that code away and we started um, implementing our own simplified um, key value access interface um, that that is not yet finished. Um, and and that key value access interface um, is supposed to implement. So, 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 so we implemented a file system implementation through that thing, and that works already for um, N5, but we have we don't have an S3, uh, a full S3 implementation of that yet because we're limited in manpower and just, it's not, not the only thing that we're doing. Um, but I was wondering if um, if you should maybe focus on that um, because the performance um, penalties for doing these unnecessary round trips um, are are pretty severe. Um, and yeah, then I also wanted to mention if there is a core implementation that implements R and, and just the core level stuff to access things, I would be very happy to use this for for the N five API support for ZAR. Or another thing that I, that I wanted to mention, like uh, about caches, the the reason why we use the why we like the N5 API, is that we that we have an image lib two layer on top of this, which is our image data representation, and that can take care of for in memory caching um, um, and and uh, garbage collected, automatically reloaded stuff and so on, uh, which is really nice for for um, for lazy evaluation and stuff like that. So 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 we would be very unhappy if that went into an inferior implementation in, in a, in a um, czar um, dialect of, of, of the API. And that is that is a library that was developed by uh, Tobias Beach is also on the call here. And that was that was all, all I wanted to say. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, I think trying to remember all the things that you raised there, um, at least as I look at it, um, and what we're doing with Glencoe software. And I think uh, I'll let Norman say what he um, would like to say on, on the Scalable Mind side and what is there with WebNosis. I'm actually pretty opinionated. Yeah, the, these libraries should not worry about caching, should not worry about multi-threading, uh, should not worry about any of these, um, as you put them, gimmicks. Um, I like the idea of at least having an API that supports slicing um, and gives people an option um, to use if they wish. Uh, at least for us, that's pretty essential. Um, at least at having something that allows you to um, to do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be the only way of doing things. And I think you know we want to make sure that a chunk wise API is possible. This isn't currently the case, for example, with JSR, you have to go through the slicing API. Um, and, you know, I think for those people who want to layer something else on top, whether it be ImageLib2 or uh, Num4j or whatever, who are trying to get uh, a NumPy like implementation of matrices inside of the JVM. There's lots of different ways of dealing with slicing and how I'm going to fetch chunks and parallel and all that kind of stuff. I think these are not the responsibilities of, of this low level library. And even if they were, you know, especially for those of us who have server implementations, we really can't have that stuff hidden from us. We need to be able to control those capabilities. Um, so um, you know, I think we're we're definitely in alignment uh, on those things for sure. Um, you know, trying to keep things simple, try to give very specific um, levels. As Sebastian mentioned, I think, you know, it is trick. You're absolutely right. Object storage is different. It just is. Um, and if you try and make it work like a file system, you're really going to be disappointed. Um, at the same time, 
I do think there is some utility in providing some of these capabilities on top of object storage um, from a API convenience point of view. I think a lot of the problems right now with JSR in particular um, and the file system implementations there. And I think Stefan, you and I had a few conversations in the past about this and specifically with N5 is there are some kind of fundamental design decisions around do you ask the storage system whether you have permissions to do something before you actually do it? <laughs> or do you do it and then react to the storage subsystem telling you, sorry, you don't have permissions to do this? Um, lots of debates on both side of this, sides of this, I'm sure. And we can, you know, I think one of the core decisions we'll have to make here is from a design perspective, making some of those decisions, or at least making some of these decisions optional. Hey, I want to check my permissions beforehand, for example, um, you know, and doing some of that stuff. Um, and, you know, I think just by the nature of a lot of what we're trying to do, we're, we're probably more trying to, as I think what Stefan's saying in the chat right now, we're trying to make we actually would like to make the file system more like an object store and not the other way around, right? Um, and that was in the spirit of what we were discussing this morning with the, with the community. The file system is a crutch in a lot of cases, right? Um, you know, it's easy to it's easy to list directories if we've got a local file system. A lot of operations are incredibly cheap to do at microsecond kind of level. That's just not always going to be the case. Um, and, you know, for a lot of things, I think that this group will, as a whole wants to do, uh, with object storage in particular, some cases we can't even list the objects in a directory, um, and actually allowing people to do that or relying on doing that, um, is probably a bad place to be, right? Uh, especially if we're talking about signed URLs and all this type of stuff. I mean, you just simply cannot, you know, you cannot do a list uh, objects um, if you're at that kind of level. Um, and if we want to have first class permissions on top of this object storage, uh, which certainly a lot of our customers are asking us to deliver, um, you know, we need to have those things. So um, I think I'll stop there cede the floor to Norman. Um, there were probably other things, uh, Stefan, that you mentioned there, but anything you want to add there, Norman, certainly in your experiences with WebNosis? Yeah, I think the key to getting this right is a good layering of abstractions on top of each other. I think most has been said already. I, th I mean, after this, we'll probably eventually start a design phase or something, and we're going to solicit more feedback uh, on, on the specific um, designs that, that we come up with. Um, and yeah, I mean, we have also strong opinions about caching um, and we also need to be able to control that uh, quite tightly in a server environment. Um, it's probably very different from, uh, from like a desktop uh, application or something. So I, I am very empathetic with that, that we need to not impose that in an opinionated way. I still think there's uh, some merits to having like a full stack um, implementation at some point, right? So, I mean, of course, it's it's cool to have to, to build this library out of multiple layers, but I think there should be at least one implementation that does the whole thing so that it can be used by end users uh, readily. And uh, that can be one implementation. It doesn't have to be the reference implementation or anything, um, I, but um, still, I think if at some point people can just get uh, get the dependency in and get some sliced data, I think that would be would be fantastic. Definitely, Norman. Definitely. Um, I think the other thing maybe to mention that's you know that we didn't speak about this morning is that. Certainly for a lot of things we're doing, um, I don't know, I'll let Norman comment on his side. We still have to, we're in, increasingly interacting with native code as well. 
Um, so this, whatever we're doing here has to play nicely inside the JVM, but also across the JVM. Um, so that's other things to think about in, in what we're doing here and what we're exchanging. Um, so, you know, it's just another set of things to think about. Um, anything you want to say about that specifically, Norman, before I pass things over to Stefan? Floor is yours, sir. Um, so, so one thing that I would find really interesting is um, to understand what um, the data type primitives are that we want to support in this layer. I mean, everybody has so far made some choices. Um, for, you, you certainly want the, the primitive type supported because that is what everybody's images are um, stored in. Um, but Tishi just mentioned in the chat um, that he would be interested to support strings. And that immediately raises the question, are there um, bar length or um, fixed length? And um, what about structs, like um, more, more difficult objects? And how do you, I don't know, what is the set of data types that you, you can technically implement all of those. Um, it would be nice to implement them through, um, through proxy-like objects that just point into arrays so you don't create objects all the time for, for stuff in Java. Um, but it would also be nice to have this very extensible, and um, and I think I think none of the implementations that we we have, I mean Haley, I, I don't know, you probably have opinions about this because NetCDF has has been dealing with weird data types for a long time from HDFI. Not be extensible. I just had to kind of make a map of the Python data types to the NetCDF data types. Um, mm -hmm. A better way would be nice. Hmm. So I Do know there's some. Sorry. Do you support any any uh, variable length um, struct like data types at this time? Not yet. No. Okay. Um, we have fixed length string. Hmm. I just wanted to mention that with the Zarvi three um, specifications, there are some data types that are basically. Um, included in the spec, and some of them are also included but marked as extension points. Um, I think that would actually be a good basis for deciding what gets into an implementation or not. And uh, But then again, I think because we will have different layers of abstractions, I mean, the lowest level is kind of this key value thing or file system thing, whatever we decide on designing in the end. I mean, that's going to give you some bytes of some sorts and then you can interpret them in, in, in different kinds of ways. And then you have layers on top of that. Then you probably, there might be a, a chunk uh, API that, that knows how to address chunks and still only gives you like a, some bytes. Um, and then on top of that, you could have um, the, the real data type sent and implemented or, yeah. At least that's how I'm thinking about it right now. I, I don't know. It's probably maybe a bit too early. No, oh, definitely, Norman. I think this is where a couple of things. So thinking about those like sort of primitive structures, Stefan, I mean, you guys will know this from N5 since it's all byte buffer driven now. I'm supporting, and largely at least, you know, if we want to interface with some native code and we want to interface with some libraries that are dealing with some of these problems and not trying to reinvent the wheel, um, you know, there's big effort in the Java community behind Apache Arrow and a bunch of in-memory specifications for uh, complex data types, right? Uh, like big effort, <laughs> right? Um, I would be loath to try and reproduce what those guys are doing. Um, certainly in forms to write this stuff down uh, or at least to transform some of, some of these components. So and in interacting with those, we'll have to think about off-heap memory and all sorts of other stuff, right? Um, so yes, we're going to have to think about more complex data types, Stefan, and maybe get our hands dirty a bit with the specification crew and try to firm some of these things up so that we're not just talking about, hey, what's convenient in Python, for example, um, but we've got something that can reasonably be implemented um across so so i just i just wanted to mention that um so so image image lib 2 is trying to do something like that right so so it was doing this on top of java 6 um 
and we have we have basically this access interface that you that you can then wrap into arbitrary types that just point into this interface that are like like um, like turbo byte buffers um, over over arbitrary things, so they cannot just be bytes. Um, however, if you if you buy into this, you're basically buying into image two, which um, I think is a great idea, <laughs> but maybe not 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 everybody's opinion. Um, where you also get like caching and um, and and other things and n-dimensional data access and weird types and so on. Um, but but a similar thing would be necessary to to limit these things. And in in N five, for example, we have made a compromise, so we're actually reading things through byte buffer and the compressors work on on, on byte arrays. Um, but eventually, um, things end up as as primitive type arrays um, because that is that is a little bit easier to deal with and and on the image two side we can use all of those. Um, but maybe for for a reference implementation of this, um, it would be okay to to just stick to byte buffers, but then also not stay in Java eight, but maybe look at the more modern features of um, how to manage memory from Java. Yeah, I don't know what the plan for byte buffers is because they are in, introducing the, this new foreign memory APIs now that is kind of replacing byte buffers or being a better byte buffer. So I don't know how how I like to, how I like basing the, the the API on byte buffer, but uh, I don't know. An interface that 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 can be that can use byte buffers or something else, which basically yeah. brings you into to that is why not <laughs> yeah i mean it's a tricky it's a tricky problem right um i don't think there's any easy answers and the evolution of the jvm right now doesn't probably doesn't make this any easier either um i don't know what the is the Fiji community still more or less saying Java eight plus, or is it? Are we Java eleven there, guys? They are currently not not working actively on moving forward from Java eight. Okay. Um, they are hoping for support, and I'm trying to accrue some 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 means at Jamelia that we that maybe maybe we can help with this. There is, yeah. So, so people have started um, doing stuff um, to move forward into Java 11, but because because in, I don't know, Fiji includes everybody's um, stuff. It is very, it is it is a little bit difficult. You I basically need a person. Probably we should move to 17. Yes, we should skip directly uh, because next time will be 35 or something. <laughs> Certainly, as the server guys, I'm all for 17, um, right? But yeah, I don't have to fight that battle with um, on image SC why the JVM I installed seven years ago doesn't work with this stuff. Um, so, and maybe we don't care, <laughs> um, but I'm not the one who has to fight that battle, guys. <laughs> Can I turn off the recording and then say maybe someone could find it? <laughs> Find a CVE somewhere or write a CVE against Java 8 that just like wipes it out. Chris, you know people. Come on. I think there's plenty there are, of go ahead, Haley. Say, there, there are quite a few security issues now with Java 8. So a lot of government organizations are no longer allowing Java 8, which is why we're, we're about to drop it, I think, from SCF Java be soon. Yeah, I mean, what we get, the the story we get told. Um, a lot when we do these infosec reviews um, is often if you don't have at least five years support on the core library, then you know you you basically can't use it as a dependency. So we're all we're getting to that area now uh, with Java 11 already, um, and I think we're well inside that. Actually, I think we got just two and a half or three years of support left on on 11. Um, so yeah, maybe it's time to break off the training wheels of whatever analogy you want to use and and commit to that. I don't know. Um, I know that would certainly make some of the other projects that are much more sort of forward thinking and you know working on the data science side quite happy if we could um, do some of that stuff. I think they would be 
um, much more would be interested in potentially trying to help us out with some of these low-level things. Do you think it would generally be a, be a bad idea to have this reference or implementation to use Java 17? And if anybody wants to use it, they can please move forward. Men can still use their old code mostly. Interesting. So what, what seems to be happening on the Python side, sort of just to kind of pair at that would be um, following what NumPy does, right? So, you know, take some library that's so key to everyone's workflow and whatever it says, you know, we're going to drop Python. What is it? I, I think 3.7 <clears throat> just got dropped, 3.8 will be dropped within the next year. You know, and it's a very regular, the old versions are being dropped. Um, but I guess there's not the concept of LTS, right? Which there is with Java. So if, if we could find some standard to, to pin ourselves to, and if that standard happens to say, you know, the latest greatest, I think that's reasonable. Maybe we have to do the analysis of what are all the libraries we're using first. But in general, keeping things more modern will make our lives simpler. Definitely. Definitely. Yep, let's do it. 17 sounds good. Or oh, what's the next well, when's the next one? The next uh, long term. I don't even know, to be honest. I like that I'm that we're now being used as the uh, scapegoat for getting uh, Fiji <laughs> to move to uh, Java 17 here. These these crazy guys, they said. <laughs> so what was the what was the project? It was like Python. What was there was a website with a clock python python 2 is dying or python 2 should die dot org or something i was watching it for a while leading up to the python 3 migration i'll have to see if i can find that maybe we have to set that up for java 8 and just let's see So I think, you know, everyone's raising a whole bunch of things that, yes, we need to decide. I don't think we're going to decide any of these things today. Um, one of the goals of putting some of these uh, repositories in place and starting to think about them is an opportunity to have some of those conversations and have a place to, to go to look at them uh, and hopefully make some of these core decisions. Um, and if that means Java 17, um, so be it. I'm looking at you know, Christian and others who are really dependent on the Fiji ecosystem, Fiji deployment structure, et cetera. Um, yeah. Um, it would be a shame for us to make a bunch of decisions that effectively freezes those folks out, but um, yeah. I, uh, I don't know. I think I'm my, my sort of long-term vision is right now, I think all, a little bit more like smaller software things that do not everything. So so I don't know if even like it's the, the Fiji is, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, more like like Linux binaries that do one thing well and input and output OMEs are. I think that's sort of my vision of uh, <laughs> bioimage analysis stuff. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't know. So uh, maybe not too much personally. Uh, yeah, I'm worried with the Fiji. I don't know. I don't know. I I, I think if nobody starts, then f then that's that just means there's more work for the core Fiji maintainers. So just if we, I mean, if ImageDip, for example, moves to seventeen, then that's already one one problem taken care of, right? So Curtis has to worry about one thing less. I think. Makes sense. It's probably a conversation worth having, right, Tobias? Yeah. 
And I don't know when the last, the next opportunity would be for us to have that conversation, but we should probably do it. Yeah. Yeah, Stefan. Yeah, I have, a, I have a, um, a concrete question. So first of all, yes, yes, about moving things forward, because I think um, we won't have a viable terminal and distributable product um, like next week. And so there is time. So if we announce this broadly enough, there, there's time for everybody else to react and adjust. And most things aren't actually that complicated. They just take take, take time to, to, to put a hand on. And that would also encourage people to move forward. Um, the other more, more concrete thing that I would really appreciate is I think we all agreed here um, violently on that having something simpler than the file system API to access these things that is more um, more amenable to to object stores and their particular latency behaviors um, would be really great. And I posted a link in the chat that we have already started this with a focus on what the what the um, access primitives are for um, things that we need in the N5 API. And I think it would be great if if we could have a discussion about this, whether it discovers everything's are, and it certainly doesn't. Because the sharding aspects, like seeking into chunks, for example, um, aren't thought of here, and and maybe that it, that could be a good starting point um, for for these for these um, for these projects to um, to move forward. Because that is the thing that is so, so for me. This is a stopping point, and we've wasted too much time on this, and 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 there is no no complete solution yet, and it's still in motion. And it would be really great to have that off the table. Also add, so there's, this came up this morning as well, that there's certainly interest from other communities to have, I, I'm not exactly sure if there's an overlap, Stefan, between the store API in Czar Python, for example, and exactly what you pasted, I'll need to look at that. Um, but in the, on the Python side to start re-implementing the store API in native code, you know, to have something, so basically to, to maybe not phase out FS spec, but to have an alternative that's doing one thing and doing one thing really well, which is the is the low level IO. Um, so possibly, so if we could define that across the multiple implementation languages, we could also wrap a native, you know, if someone has the libraries, we could wrap it into this interface that you're talking about. That would obviously be yep. a choice and we're going to need a pure Java implementation to start with, but there, there would be the possibility to only do the sharding one time, right? Yeah, fine. So, so, but, but for example, because it, it has been mentioned, um, yes, listing directories on file systems is easy. Um, but since we're working with a tree-based container, listing the uh, children of a tree node is something that everybody will do at some point. How they do it um, is is implementation specific. But I think this needs to be part of this API, and it needs to be abstracted so you can replace it with something that does it efficiently. Like for example, on S3, you make a you make a um, uh, a C query with a with a dedicated um, 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 search string and stuff like that, and they can be fast these operations, right? Or like recursively um, deleting an entire um, branch of a tree. This is something that we need in these containers, um, but the specific implementation, like the the way how a file system would do this, because it recursively has to like um, bubble up. And um, on a key value store, where you just say delete everything that matches this particular key, um, that's that's um, that's to, that's up for 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 the implementation. And those are the things that everybody needs. Yeah. Yes, sir. Lots of nodding. Yep. I think with the other thing is we don't want to freeze out um, some of these more. I'll use the term advanced, whether they're advanced or not, is uh, you can make your own decision. Um, you know, actually Azure Object Storage and GCS um, are have some really nice features. I think some of us would really like to use. I mean, Tobias mentioned that they're about locking um, some, you know, uh, atomic operations, all this kind of stuff. Uh, it would be really nice, right, to be able to uh, forward those other implementations to take advantage of some of these features, right? Um, you know, yes, S3 is kind of the lingua franca here, but 
uh, at the same time, geez, it would be nice to um, to use to take advantage of some of these additional features. And obviously, we all know on the file system, you know, a lot of these things are possible, right? Um, so definitely don't want to freeze those guys out uh, from having the option uh, to do those things. Yes, Christian. Just, uh, I mean, I, I'm ha happy to hear that there seems to be quite a lot of consens. That's good, right? I mean, do you then, like, what would you do? Would you like make with 10 people a hackathon and then, or what's, what would be the, like, <laughs> the way forward? I think the plan at the moment um, at least as far as the group will put the original presentation together is concerned, Christian, is I think what we'd like to try and do is to get some of the work that we already talked about done, <laughs> right? Um, I know everybody's excited about, you know, worrying about file system implementations and all this kind of stuff, but if we have one security issue in BLOSK, we're all screwed, right? Uh, we have poor, poor maintainership. We got, you know, we don't have control over the repositories, all sorts of stuff. So we, we've got some mess to clean up and then i think we've got some probably i don't know what do we, whatever we want to call it whether we want to call it a manifesto or a set of design uh, decisions that we all agree on or that we don't agree on um where we're going to have some um opportunities for extension points try to our best to put those things together um and then probably try and um work on some of these repositories in a kind of pre 0.1 let's try some of these things out i think some of these things we're only going to learn by doing rather than trying to design uh as stefan said you know they've already tried to work through some of the issues on object storage and worrying about performance and queries these are some of some of the things you just don't they're very difficult to design for up front um right so try our best to get some of these things written down in a good place. I don't know what the best place is, but we'll probably try and organize the the groups via image SC, via the mailing lists, whether that's uh, Josh and others were questioning about, hey, do we have a Discord where we can all go to to talk about some of these things? I don't know what the right, the best answer is. Um, personally, I'm not that big a fan of trying to do hackathons to do this type of work, um, but I might be able to be convinced that it's a you know good idea for us to you know get together for three or four hours and do something um mindful of all of the time zones we've got involved here and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I do think, yes, there is an incredible amount of actually we we I think we all agree a lot more than we disagree on some of the fundamental things that need to be done here. Um, and everybody knows that some of these basic things are essentially undecided and we need to um to get together and and do some of those things right um that's it i think we've got the recording or at least we will have the recording it will be posted so if you really are interested and in, you know you're having difficulty sleeping and you want to uh, revisit this conversation again, you can, um, the crew is going to put things up on um, YouTube and link them from the OMU community meeting um, page, which Sebastian has conveniently put in the chat. Uh, so all that will be up there. Um, John, short answer is I don't know right now. Um, I will try my best to announce at least our intentions speaking on behalf of Glencoe Software, uh, at least on Image SC. Um, so we can try and get everybody together somewhere uh, to get these things um, together. I won't speak for Norman. Um, Norman, anything you want to say there? 
No, I think we'll pitch in there on MHSC. I think that's the best starting place. And then we can fan out from there to whatever we want and decide is, is best. I mean, MHSC is probably not the best place to have deep discussions about design documents and stuff like that, but uh, it's probably a good place to uh, announce these things. Oh, great. The BS has already mentioned the Zulup chats and all sorts of other things. I think we've got, we definitely have plenty of communication avenues to try and have some of these discussions. So probably more than we want. All right. Is, is this amenable for Haley? Because I'm not sure if she's in those communities specifically. Haley's like, what's Zulip? Where is this? What What's image SC? Uh <laughs> yeah um yeah we'll try our best to to do that and maybe we can also channel some of this uh josh and the czar steering council as well and try and fan out as much as we can right um, yeah sun keeps actively thinking and working on things i don't think there's a, a great solution yet so watch this space he really likes Discord, though. I wanted to uh, just just ask one more thing, maybe get some like a, a temperature from the community. Um, if there was a project that would implement these key value store things in, let's say, Rust or C plus plus on a native thing, um, would you guys be interested in having a JNI interface basically that wraps that? So. Um, benefits would be would be a shared implementation. It could be used across Python, Java, R, MATLAB, whatever. Um, but yeah, has obviously also has some downsides. Well, what do you guys think? Well, what would what would the native thing be again? Uh... So it would wrap around um, these these key value store or file system abstraction, like the, the probably the lowest level thing. So coming at me from the, the Python ecosystem, probably the, what FS spec does, right? So it provides basically a, a unified interface to a bunch of different um, object store providers, file system, maybe in memory stores. So a bunch of different things. Haley? I was going to say, um, we have historically avoided JNI and JNA in that CF Java because I guess we hit some issues, but I don't actually really know what the problems were that we encountered because that was pre my time working on that CF Java. Um, but so it would take some convincing over here at Unidata to, to get them to be in favor of wrapping of native implementation. Yeah, I think it becomes much easier when we're talking about server-side applications. Um, Stefan's about to, to weigh in, I'm sure, on what it means to distribute this stuff. I mean, I think the only thing I would say to your question there, Norman, is I think we'd all look around and consider it quite seriously, but we know that know the amount of effort that's required for us to actually consider it seriously, right? That's not just a repository with cool code somewhere. That's commitment to having binaries, that's commitment to support, that's commitment to working cross-platform, that's commitment to a whole ton of things, right? Um, not just, hey, I've got a great repo um, with all these native implementations, right? Uh, and I think the closest to that that we have right now, if you're interested in looking at you know, what this actually takes to do, is to go look at what the TileDB guys are trying to do, right? They've got support for all of these object stores. They've got a low-level API. They've got all this stuff, and it's all in C++, right? And the amount of code that is there, right, is immense. And the build problems and all that kind of stuff are huge, right? Um, so I think we all know what what it means in order to, to do that. And it's not just coding it up, right? Um, Stefan? So I'm, I'm strongly opposed to this idea because it's um, it, it adds an additional complexity for something that is potentially very simple. Um, 
and that relates to running multi-threaded code, um, statefulness or statelessness, um, protection of whatever. You're basically implementing a file system driver. And I think if you if you're really serious and this project evolves over a long time, um, you have re-implemented the HDF five um, library. And and I think we should not re-implement the HDF five library because the HDF five library is already great. So. Um, and it makes it it makes it particularly hard to add additional backends because you would have to do this in that native implementation and then you have to do it for every platform and you have to recompile it for every platform and you have to make sure that you distribute it for every platform and we should we should um i don't know i, I think that's an okay thing to do if you are in a very specific environment and for particular reasons so I think HDF5, they have made a good choice to do this um, as they do it because they provide continued support for, for, for all platforms. Um, we have issues developing an API in the first place <laughs> with the people on this call. And, and, and we would have to increase the community and increase funding to do this successfully. So, so I think it would, be, it would be a better start to not try to notify this. There are also other examples. I mean, there is Tensor Store, which basically has this kind of unified um, API. But yeah, please just, I don't know, distributing this over all the new processor types that are coming up and, and, and stuff like that will be, it's hard. And thinking about mobile devices or whatever, that, that may just have, I don't know, different architectures. Yes, definitely. We're also forgetting the strong that. Strong opinion, sorry. No. Um... I think we've got we got lots of strong opinions here. Uh, don't worry, Stefan. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely with you there. I think doing this in pure Java is in our interest, um, at least immediately. And there's nothing that says that we can't have a native implementation of some of this stuff going forward, right? I don't think, I don't think we're saying that that can't happen. I think the only thing we're saying is that this group is not about to, to work on that at this particular point in time. Um, Glencoe software certainly doesn't have the developer resources to put into such a project right now. Um, and further to that, let's not forget that, you know, our brothers and sisters on the JavaScript side who would really like to be able to use, um, some of these concepts on, and if we start putting all of our effort into native implementations, it kind of freezes them out a little bit. Right. I mean, I know that there's tons of work on WebAssembly and trying to get native code there and all that kind of stuff, but um, you know, that's a big, big job and a minefield for us for for all sorts of reasons. Yes, Josh. Yeah, I think I'll just add. So I, I think that's a good way of putting it that we're not, and I I wouldn't want us to, and I don't think we're the right people to invest in native drivers. Um I think it does make sense, though, to consider it when it comes to the design decisions. Like, yeah, so the interface should be pure Java, you know, agreed. Um, but I think be ready for conversations coming from these other implementation languages saying, oh, I've got something. Do you want to use it? And I think it would be unfortunate if we shut down that conversation because that is developer capacity that we don't have to provide. Right. So I want to make sure we stay open to that, uh, but not necessarily that we do the work. Yes, sir. Definitely. Very good. And I think the C++ community is going to have to have a very similar conversation to the one that we just had about, hey, which APIs are we using? Which uh, base libraries are we using? What are we doing about object storage? All this kind of stuff. Um, you know, that's definitely going to have to happen. Right on. Anything else before we close, ladies and gentlemen? Thanks to everyone for the time. I know that um, that's one of our most precious elements at the moment across lots of us. So thank you very much for the time you've given us and hopefully the time that we will be able to spend together moving some of these things forward. Um, I'm not even going to comment on what's in the chat right now. Um, 
The only other thing that I was going to ask is potentially, and maybe Stefan and Josh and Tobias know best when the next meeting might be where some of us might physically be in each other's presence. I don't, I don't even know what that even would be. Um, maybe Haley wants to host us. Um, It'd certainly be nice to get together. I know a lot of us have not seen each other for at least two, if not three years at this point. So I'm volunteering to um, host people at Geneva, if that's an option for, for you. Does anyone know what the next I2K is? Was there any plans for that? I don't think there's any plans. OK. Haley, are you coming to EGU? I wasn't planning on it. So there's a, a meeting in Vienna in April if anyone would like to do Vienna. So Norman, on the EM it. side, is anybody is anybody That's getting together soon? Not really, no. I think. There's a I Gordon think research. everybody just uh, did their conferences that they didn't do during COVID this year. And if they're on a two-year schedule, then next year is nothing. <laughs> yep. But yeah. I know, I think, um, Norman, you're going to be at CBIAS next week, right? I think Aaron will be there from Glencoe as well as David Sterling and a couple others. Um, that's probably not the time for this conversation, but at least for people to get together and see each other face to face. Um, so if you are at CBIAS, we'll, some of us will be there. That's, uh, the Crick, uh, meeting here, uh, next week. Um, so I guess we'll watch out and see whether we can get together, um, soon. Fingers crossed. All right. Any with anyone with anything else to say? Very good. Thank everyone again. Um, recordings will be up. Um, try our best to communicate as best we can with the tools that we have. Um, nice to see everyone. Have a nice rest of the evening, day, uh, wherever you may be. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. Thank you.